Kavya Malikarjun, who is our consultant pediatric cardiologist, who will be coordinating this session for today. So without much ado, I'll of course be also inviting Dr. Rajat Pejavar, one of my colleague consultants in neonatology for this meeting. He'll be joining us very soon. So welcome everybody to this meeting. Maybe we can start with uh, the presentation first and then later Dr. Kavya Malikarjun can lead the discussions. Thank you, looking forward. Vikrant, you can start. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, so today we'll be uh, discussing about critical congenital heart disease, uh, which is one of the important uh, aspect of uh, neonatal care. And particularly we'll be discussing about congenital pulmonic stenosis in one of the uh, baby uh, that we had noted. So uh, to begin with, uh, we'll be discussing about the case, a brief approach to critical congenital heart disease and uh, uh, some detail about uh, congenital pulmonic stenosis. So to start with this, uh, a term baby, 37 plus six week female baby was delivered to a G2A1 mother uh, with hypothyroidism and gestational diabetes mellitus. It was a vaginal delivery uh, with a birth, baby was born with a birth weight of 2.48 kg. So baby cried immediately after birth. No active resuscitation was required. Uh, baby was saturating 93 to 98% in room air and no supplementary oxygen was required after birth. Uh, so coming to the antenatal history, uh, there was no complaint of any PV leak or PV bleed. Uh, married since three years, non-consanguineous marriage. Uh, first issue, there was a missed abortion at six weeks and no dilatation and triage was done. Uh, this was the second issue and uh, uh, there was a history of gestational diabetes mellitus and was on metformin and hypothyroidism on thyronol. Uh, antenatal scan, which is an important part as far as the critical congenital heart disease are concerned. So uh, the AFI was adequate and Dopplers were normal and interval growth was fairly normal. Uh, and the fetal med medicine had done a uh, review scan which showed no obvious anomaly per se, but the fetal echo had shown some pulmonary regurgitation, moderate tricuspid regurgitation and flow acceleration across pulmonary wall. So this uh, basically this finding were pointing to a antenatal diagnosis of suspected uh, pulmonic stenosis. So this baby uh, was delivered and on examination uh, after birth in an ICU baby had a, a normal physical examination heart rate was 130, uh, respiratory rate was 46 and uh, there was no cyanosis uh, saturating 93 to 99% in room air. There was no preductal postductal saturation. These were the findings after the baby was born. Uh, on uh, cardiac examination, a grade 4 uh, ejection systolic marvel was noted in uh, left lower sternal border and thrill was noted. Apart from that, rest of the systemic examination was fairly normal. Uh, however, the baby was, uh, as since the baby was antenatally detected to have pulmonic stenosis, uh, an immediate uh, echo post uh, delivery, the baby had uh, done a review, a re review echo done by the pediatric cardiologist, which was suggestive of uh, bicuspid pulmonic valve. Uh, thickened leaflet and findings the history of severe pulmonic stenosis with the right ventricular hypertrophy. Also, a grade two tricuspid uh, TR jet was noted. Uh, the ductal shunt, uh, there was a moderate PDA with shunting from left to right and a PFO left to right shunt was noted. At 24 hours of life, the baby had frequent desaturation noted for which uh, baby was started on CPAP support and the review echo was uh, done, which was suggestive of increased pulmonary pressure gradient, uh, about 54 millimeter of Hg. Along with that, there was a bidirectional shunting across the PDA and grade 2 PR jet. Uh, in view of the above finding, uh, since uh, this was heading to a uh, duct-dependent uh, pulmonary circulation, we have started on PG infusion and uh, balloon pulmonary vulvo uh, vulvoplasty was planned by the pediatric cardiologist. At 66 hours of life, this procedure was done and the baby underwent uh, uh, the procedure successfully. Uh, post procedure, baby remained stable in room air, hemodynamically stable. Uh, post prostaglandin was stop stopped immediately on table after the procedure. Baby was started on propanolol post procedure in of some infantibular spasm that can be noted post procedure and was, however, later stopped. Post procedure, a review echo was done, which was a history of pulmonary pressure gradient of 16 to 18 mm of Hg with some trivial PR and PR, which is uh, permissible as far as the post-procedure is concerned, and uh, no PDA was noted. So uh, coming to the uh, factor determining the decision to do the pulmonary, uh, balloon pulmonary valvoplasty. So as you see on the uh, 
four chamber view there was a tr jet which was noted with the pulmonary uh, with a gradient of 83 so uh, this was one of the factor which was a uh, pointer towards a, an intervention along with that on the short axis uh, view uh, as we can see there was a bidirectional shunt so initially there was a ductal shunt from left to right However, uh, by 24 hours of life when a review video was done, there was a bidirectional shunt which was uh, noted, as you can see here, a uh, bidirectional shunt. And along with that, uh, the clinically desaturations were noted. So all these factors were the reason to go ahead with the balloon pulmonary volvoplasty. So uh, intervention-wise, baby was uh, provided respiratory support, IV fluids, antibiotics, close vital monitoring was done throughout the NIC course. Baby was initially started on OG feeds and Subsequently, uh, post-procedure, baby was started on uh, pallida and breastfeeding and tolerated feeds well and GI-wise where there were no complaints. Uh, blood gases uh, initially had shown some acidosis uh, due, uh, at around 24 hours of life when the, they were in the desaturations where their uh, respiratory acidosis particularly was noted. Uh, along with that, pain management uh, was ensured as uh, this can further increase the pulmonary pressure. So pain management uh, was taken care of. Uh, Pre-procedure, baby was intubated and later on extubated uh, and uh, shifted to CPAP and subsequently wind off to room air. For this procedure, a femoral vein access was uh, done by the interventional radiologist and uh, uh, the balloon dilatation was done with this. So coming to the procedure, so basically uh, for this procedure, uh, the femoral uh, vein access was ensured uh, and then a TISAC, TISAC uh, balloon catheter. So this catheter is particularly uh, very feasible and use, uh, commonly used in neonets. So uh, the dimension that was used was six into two centimeters. So this dimension was decided based on the eco finding of the pulmonary, uh, eco finding of the dimension of the pulmonary wall, which was around uh, annulus, which was around 5.4 mm. So you have to use 120 to 140% of the uh, one pulmonary uh, annulus, the balloon size that has to be used. So six into two centimeter Tyshek balloon was used. This was passed through the femoral, femoral vein. And as you can see, it entered the IV, femoral vein into IVC, into uh, right atrium and right uh, ventricle into pulmonary wall and through that to the PDA and uh, up to the descending uh, 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 aorta. And uh, these two points, as you can see, are the points, uh, the midpoint of this is where the dilatation can happen. So uh, a venous, uh, fluoroscopy was done to confirm the position of the uh, catheter initially before inserting the Taisha catheter, the position was confirmed and uh, later on it was inflated and as you can see, this is the waist of the balloon catheter. Uh, so basically this balloon, uh, waist of the balloon catheter has to, balloon has to lie in uh, along the wall uh, and then it is uh, inflated and this was done and uh, baby successfully underwent the procedure. Uh, so uh, that was about the uh, case. I would like to uh, 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 discuss further about an approach to critical congenital heart disease. Uh, so incidence of the critical uh, CHD in it is about six to eight per thousand live births. 25% of them are considered critical. So this is uh, uh, very important as far as the management, neonatal management is concerned because 25% of this uh, babies would require immediate management. They have important is to diagnose them and treat them. Uh, if this up to most of the this neonates might appear normal and routine physical examination. And that's why it is very important to have a systemized approach to diagnose these babies. Uh, and the fact that early recognition is the most import, important intervention in reducing mortality has to be remembered. And that's why one should be very aware of critical congenital heart disease, especially in cases where the facility for fetal echo is not available and antenatal diagnosis is not possible. It is very important to keep uh, this uh, thing in mind and uh, have an approach towards, systemized approach towards treating a patient with a critical congenital heart disease. Uh, CCHD can obviously result in rapid neonatal deterioration and death unless detected and treated. American Heart Association uh, defines critical congenital heart disease as any CHD which requires intervention within the first year of the life. Uh, complete repair or palliation can result in low mortality and reasonable quality of life. So this is uh, about CCHD. So while approaching CCHD, it is very important for factors like prenatal diagnosis. So with the advancement in the echocardiography and uh, the fetal uh, echo being done in most of the advanced center, it is uh, easily diagnosed. But as far as the centers where facilities for fetal echo is not 
uh, available it's uh, it's of paramount importance to focus on the clinical aspects and uh, uh, things like pulse oximetry and postnatal echocardiography so these are the factors which have to be kept in mind in those facilities especially where a fetal echo are not available uh, and the uh, centers where fetal echo is done it's uh, it's it's very uh, uh, where it is done and when it is done it is it is very important to transfer them to facilities where these babies can be properly managed so prenatal diagnosis uh, most critical CSD clinically ap uh, become apparent only during or after the transitional circulation. Uh, diagnosis in the prenatal period allows uh, in safe utero transfer of the mother and the big mother. Outcomes after surgery depends upon the end organ injury at admission and the condition of the neonate. So basically, uh, this in utero, whenever the baby is diagnosed prenatally and if uh, facilities do not operate or intervene immediately are not available, uh, it is important to transport such babies to the facilities. Also, those babies who have not been diagnosed uh, should be approached and, and should be referred to a center where they can be treated. But since the end organ injury due to the systemic hypoperfusion and uh, uh, hypoxia can and can be very detrimental as far as the neonatal outcome is concerned. Uh, transporting such babies is one of the important factors. So one must be aware of uh, uh, this fact that these babies usually uh, require uh, good amount of uh, respiratory support along with that prostaglandin infusion and hemodynamic stability. So all these factors are important as far as transporting a baby with CCHD is concerned. Uh, Pre-dental diagnosis, so uh, just uh, as we have a newborn screening program for a uh, newborn metabolic screening program, a prenatal diagnosis of this condition uh, uh, should be encouraged in, in our country as well as all the centers so that uh, better outcomes will be there and, as, and, the, and, uh, and the, the prognosis can be poor, uh, poor as, as far as the units, uh, neonatal outcome is concerned. So clinically, uh, these babies can present with cyanosis, uh, respiratory distress uh, without any evident pulmonary disease or any evidence of sepsis and unexplained shock. So presentations like this, which don't point particularly to any pulmonary disease or sepsis, one should be aware. The central cyanosis can be noted, especially in duct dependent uh, uh, pulmonary lesions with the uh, duct dependent uh, pulmonary circulation. And one should be, uh, differentiate them from the respiratory cause uh, chest X-ray can give a fairly so those lesions with duct dependent pulmonary circulation will have oligemic lung fields and uh, as uh, if a respiratory cause for cyanosis there would be uh, 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 heterogeneous infiltrates with findings suggestive of some pneumonitis so one should be aware along with that blood gases which can suggest respiratory acidosis and hyperoxia test which is uh, not has become obsolete but in centers where uh, uh, it's not available. Facilities are not available. This can be used fairly, but the false uh, uh, positivity rate has to be considered. But centers where uh, facilities are not available, hyperoxia can help in differentiating the cardiac versus respiratory causes for the con critical congenital heart disease. Uh, one of the important thing that one can note is the pulmonary edema in uh, CCHD. So particularly uh, the LF ventricular outflow tract obstruction uh, and uh, this finding can be seen on X-ray with particular X-ray finding. One of the thing is on conventional, uh, one can note is that uh, with conventional respiratory management, uh, the critical congenital heart disease, there won't be an improvement unless particular intervention like prostaglandin infusion or inter surgical or medical inter cardi cardi cardiac interventions are done unless they are done, uh, a, a further worsening would be there uh, uh, as compared to a respiratory condition, which might improve with the conventional respiratory management. So these are some of the uh, pointers towards uh, uh, getting a uh, uh, formal echo done and uh, getting a pediatric cardiologist involved and managing these babies. It's of paramount importance in CCHD. Also, when, uh, this surgical intervention uh, shows good results in uh, many of these cases. And uh, unexplained shock in babies uh, with findings uh, with abounding pulses and uh, or feeble or absent pulses. So clinically, uh, this uh, factors one should be examined well in a baby with a CCHD. Also, a baby who has sudden clinical deterioration in an otherwise stable unit, uh, so just like baby might might be born uh, with a with fairly good saturations and good hemodynamics and respiratory stability, but all of a sudden this baby deteriorates, one should always uh, keep in mind, if, especially in cases where a, a, a formal fetal echo and screening is not done, one should always uh, keep this in thing in mind. So sus when, when suspected uh, cardiogenic shock is done and uh, if an access to echocardiogram is there, definitely uh, a diagnosis should be concerned uh, 
to confirm any structural heart disease and uh, to manage it accordingly. If there's facility for low echocardiogram, one can rely on features like absent femoral, which can be noted in coaptation, interrupted aortic arch, and preductal postductal saturation difference uh, can be noted in uh, cyanotic condition with uh, critical congenital heart disease. Also, sudden collapse and absence of pointers to sepsis, as well as cardiomegaly. So all these factors one should be uh, keep in mind while approaching a case of uh, CCHD. So pulse oximetry screening. So various uh, various associations have different uh, uh, this thing uh, as far as the pulse oximetry is concerned. So but routinely universal pulse oximetry can uh, it's a very easy bedside test and help in uh, uh, ruling out or getting a formal echo done and ruling out congenital heart, critical congenital heart disease. So uh, pulse oximetry screening should be a part of the neonatal care. So uh, as you can see as the approach so. Uh, at around 24 hours of age, the pulse oximetry screening can be done. And uh, if there are saturation, especially such, uh, and uh, in, while doing a pulse oximetry, it's important to use uh, monitors like Massimo, which uh, uh, which have a, a good detection rate. And if a failure, if uh, there is a 89% or less saturation noted in the, the right hand or the foot, in then uh, one can consider it as a uh, pulse ox uh, for a fail uh, test and should a formal echo should be done. Uh, in cases where the oxygen saturation is around 95% uh, and the difference of 3% or less is noted between the upper and the lower limb saturation, then we can consider it as a pass test. In uh, babies who are having a saturation of around 90 to 94% in right hand or foot and a difference more than 4%, a repeat test should be done, a formal repeat uh, pulse oximetry screening should be done. And even after one hour, if the saturations have remained less than 94% in the right hand or foot, and uh, uh, and if there's a difference more than 4% between the upper limb and the low limb, uh, then one should consider it as a failed test and an echo should be done and pediatric cardiology opinion and intervention should be considered. Uh, whereas if the pulse oximetry shows more than 95% and uh, more in right hand and foot than our uh, and difference of less than 3%, then you can consider it passed on retesting. So another thing is fetal and postnatal echocardiography. So one of the important thing when considering as we discussed about is, uh, is considering this fetal and postnatal echocardiography is very important uh, while treating, a, while dealing with the case of con critical congenital heart disease. So the common differentials of CCHD in neonatal period without a murmur are TGA with an intact ventricular septum where a emergency balloon arterial septostomy can be required and a formal echo uh, to look at the discordance has to be ensured and also the ductal flow and the presence of ASD and uh, ductus and prostaglandin infusion has to be ensured in such cases. Uh, obstructed TAPVC, HLHS, critical pulmonic stenosis, and pulmonary atresia uh, with ESD. So these are the examples. Uh, won't go into details in the management of this uh, as of now. Uh, so uh, while approaching a duct-dependent lesion, there are two important things that is duct-dependent systemic circulation and duct dependent pulmonary circulation. So duct dependent systemic circulation, the common uh, condition that one can notice coaptation of aorta, interrupted aortic arch, HLHS and critical AS. So this uh, left ventricular outflow tract obstruction cases can present uh, with systemic hypoperfusion, cardiogenic shock, pulmonary edema and, uh, uh, and depending on uh, the clinical condition, immediate uh, intervention can be required and again, prostaglandin uh, infusion is important in these cases, uh, along with routine uh, intensive care, neonatal intensive care. Uh, the falling into the duct-dependent pulmonary circulations are the pulmonary atresia, Epstein anomaly, and critical pulmonic stenosis. So uh, these lesions uh, present usually, especially when the duct closes, this can present with severe hypoxia and cyanosis and acidosis and the right heart failure and it's very important in this condition to uh, diagnose and treat them. Closure of ductus uh, arteriosus in this can present systemic hypoperfusion and shock. So ductus is an important factor in, in both the duct dependent uh, lesions and uh, prostaglandin is one of the uh, important miracle drug that has to be used in such cases. So in uh, duct dependent pulmonary circulation, the uh, pulmonary blood flow is affected basically while in systemic circulation, duct dependent systemic circulation, the flow from the aortic wall uh, is affected. PDA is the main source for pulmonary blood flow here and uh, to maintain, especially in critical congenital heart disease, while uh, in also in systemic. 
uh, PDA closure can one can uh, uh, find uh, certain saturation drops as the PDA closes, especially in duct dependent pulmonary circulation, uh, while this presents with shock and hypoperfusion. Uh, intensely uh, cyanotic, this clinically, this duct dependent pulmonary circulation babies will present with intense cyanosis, increased work of breathing, and pulmonary oligemia on chest x ray. So, this can point to a uh, case of duct dependent lesion, pulmonary circulation lesion. While while dealing with a case with a duct dependent systemic circulation, uh, it is very difficult to differentiate unless any formal echocardiography done and uh, other causes uh, can uh, mimic in the similar way. So, a formal echo is very important. Uh, both the cases, prostaglandin infusion is uh, urgent uh, initiation is important, especially those cases who are to be transported and uh, they need an urgent surgical intervention. PG event should be started immediately. So, coming to prostaglandin uh, event, so it should be initiated at the earliest in CCHD uh, since it can, uh, can lead to apnea and uh, uh, other side effects, uh, especially during transportation. Uh, intubation and uh, mechanical ventilation would be a better uh, option. Uh, and one can note improval in the SpO2 within 30 minutes after starting the infusion. Uh, it's usually started at 0.0550 nanogram to 100 nanogram per kg per minute and maintenance dose as low as 5 to 10 microgram per uh, 5, 5 to 10 nanogram per kg per minute can be given. Uh, the most common side effect while uh, giving the prostaglandin infusion that can be noted is apnea. So mechanical ventilation intubation has to be kept in mind. And whenever a baby is uh, present with apneic episode and non-spontaneous, uh, this has to be done. Uh, hypotension, fever, leukocytosis, flushing, bradycardia, and NEC are the other side effect which has to be kept in mind. So it's just a ready reckoner. So one, uh, especially while uh, this, all the neonatologists should be aware of uh, the, the doses and the infusion and infusion pump and uh, the infusion of the drug has to be started as soon as a uh, diagnosis or a clinical clue pointing towards the CCHD is made, one should start the prostaglandin infusion. So coming to the uh, discussion about the congenital pulmonic stenosis. So there are three path pathologic types uh, that can be seen is one is the valvular pulmonic stenosis, which can be noted as a, uh, with a thickened pulmonic wall which can be seen on a short axis view on a 2D echo. Uh, leaflets can be appear a dome shaped or a thin dome shape during systole. Uh, in syndromic causes for uh, pulmonic stenosis like Noonan syndrome, uh, dysplastic thickened pulmonary wall can be seen while a bicuspid wall can be associated with a condition like TOF. The another type of pulmonic, so the volvular pulmonic stenosis is most common. Isolated infundibular stenosis or subvalvular are the other type of pulmonic stenosis. Uh, they can be due to the fibromuscular not narrowing, especially in cases of TOF, while secondarily due to valvular stenosis, uh, secondary to valvular stenosis, this can be noted in fundibular stenosis. Supravalvular or peripheral uh, uh, stenosis can be noted and can be associated with other CSD. Uh, this can be present uh, in the main pulmonary artery or they can be noted around the branch. And dealing with this case, especially syndromic and the supravalvular peripheral pulmonary stenosis with a surgical or a cardiac intervention is uh, difficult and the outcome can be very uh, poor in such cases. So pathophysiologically, pulmonic stenosis can cause uh, hypoplasia of right ventricle due to the uh, 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 increased uh, uh, pressure at the pulmonary wall. And this can result in right ventricular hypertrophy. This results in, in uh, right ventricular pressure more than left ventricular pressure. And this can cause increased uh, right atrial pressure and resulting in uh, right to left shun along the uh, patent foramen oval and which can present with cyanosis and hypoxemia. So the Pulmonic stenosis can be associated with PST, ASD, PDA, TOF, uh, and the post-surgical repair of TGA can cause pulmonic stenosis. That has to be kept in mind. And syndromes like Noonan's, congenital rubella, leopard, Watson, and allegedly are associated with pulmonic stenosis. Especially this dysplastic pulmonic wall can be noted in syndromic variety of uh, the causes for this pulmonic stenosis, which are difficult to manage. Uh, clinically, babies will present with uh, poor feeding, uh, uh, probably due to uh, uh, right heart failure, the baby can present with poor feeding. There will be tachypnea and cyanosis and hypoxia and blood gases will show acidosis. So these findings can be present when a baby can present with critical PSD. Uh, 
physically there will be tachypnea, cyanosis, desaturation, and signs of ventricular dysfunction due to catamegaly. Cardiac exam examination can show left parasternal heave due to right ventricular hypertrophy. A systolic thrill can be noted. Auscultatory findings like ejection systolic murmur can be found, and ejection click can be heard in uh, cases with critical pulmonic stenosis. So coming to the echocardiographic findings while dealing with the case of pulmonic stenosis, so multiple factors has to be considered when a formal echo is done. So we look at the pressure gradient across the pulmonary wall, uh, the right ventricular pressure. So multiple uh, factors like PR velocity and gradient, orientation of the interventricular septum, shunting at the ASD and PDA, and uh, right ventricular function using TAPSE or tissue Doppler using, uh, imaging using the TAE index or MPI can be done. And the morphology of the pulmonary wall has to be uh, noted in while uh, evaluating the echocardiographically a case of pulmonic stenosis. So uh, to find the pressure gradient, usually uh, a short axis view can be used. Short axis view and uh, uh, placing a continuous wave Doppler along the main pulmonary artery. And uh, one can find the velocity, uh, VTI. And using Bernoulli's equation, uh, 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 the pulmonary pressure gradient can be calculated. So this is one of the uh, important and uh, easy way to look at the fact, uh, pressures, which will help in. So basically intervention in a critical pulmonic stenosis uh, depend on the echocardiographic finding, the pressure, the gradients, the ductal and the uh, ASD flow. So echocardiographic evol evaluation is very important. So this can be, the, in mild stenosis, the pressure around 35 to 40 can be noted in moderate, 40 to 60 and 70 can be noted. And severe is considered in neonates more than 60 to 70 millimeter of HG. This is where in cardiac intervention can be is required. And when these pressures are noted, they, it can be less, in mild stenosis, it will be less than 50%. In moderate, 50 to 75% of the left ventricular pressure, while in severe, it will be more than 75 so uh, this is a, 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 as far as the pressure gradient is concerned. Uh, uh, so after placing the continuous wave Doppler, uh, one can place the uh, marker here and can get the velocity with Bernoulli's equation, the pulmonary pressure gradient can be calculated. Uh, another important thing that has to be seen is the uh, TR jet. So apart from pulmonary hypertension, where we can note a TR jet in pulmonic stenosis, TR jet is of importance when if, the, if a recordable gradient is noted along the TR jet and if the gradient is high, like in this case, grade 2 TR was noted, it definitely suggests a, a backflow across the tricuspid wall and it is considered as one of the indication to intervene. So uh, TR jet can be calculated on a uh, four chamber view and uh, one can see the bluish jet that is seen. Uh, uh, so usually uh, we use the BART thing that is bl uh, uh, blue away and red towards. So when, uh, when, when one see the uh, blue jet on the four chamber view, a continuous Doppler can be placed and the gradient can be noted. And uh, this is another thing that has to be evaluated. Uh, orientation again is so, uh, modified short axis view uh, uh, can be used where a right ventricle and the left ventricle and uh, left ventricle and right ventricle are noted. So usually uh, there will be a, 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 a spherical appearance of the left ventricle. And if there is a change in the orientation, like an O shift is the normal config configuration where the uh, ventricular uh, pressure is of the right ventricle is less than 50%. If the septum, septum flattening and uh, is seen, interventricular septum flattening is seen along with a D-shaped configuration of left ventricle. That means the right arterial pressure, right ventricular pressure is more than 50% and it suggests it is an indirect evidence of increased right ventricular pressure and uh, a pointer towards intervention. Uh, while as far as severe and critical pulmonic stenosis is concerned, one can see the bowing of the interventricular septum into the left ventricle. So this is a very uh, important one of the indirect evidence to suggest increased pulmonary uh, uh, pulmonary pressure and increase and right ventricular hypertrophy. So uh, one can use this indirect evidences to intervene in these cases. Another important thing is to assess the right ventricular function. So uh, to assess the right ventricular function, there can be TAPSA is one of the method and another one is the K index or myocardial performance index. So uh, in the four chamber view along the annulus, uh, if you place an M mode, M mode of the, uh, on the uh, echocardiography machine, when it is placed, one can get this waveform. Uh, so this is basically the systolic and diastolic movement of the uh, tricuspid wall. 
as you can see and this distance uh, can be calibrated used with a uh, with a tracer uh, usually in neonates if this uh, in term neonates if the value of the this tap say is less than 10 that suggests right ventricular dysfunction and right ventricular dysfunction becomes an urgent indication to intervene especially in cases of uh, right ventricular outflow tract obstruction uh, as far as preterms are con concerned, any value less than 5 millimeter can be considered as a marker to intervene in this case. So another important method to assess the right ventricular function is a fractional area shortening of right ventricle. So as you can see, a four chamber view is used and a simple Simpson's biplanar method is used in this case, where one can actually delineate the borders and uh, using, so basically for Simpson's biplanar method, uh, ECG pro, uh, uh, electrodes are also connected uh, to the echocardiography machine and the dimensions of the right ventricular right ventricular end diastolic area and the right ventricular end systolic area are calculated and using the formula for FAC that is end diastolic area minus end systolic area up divided by end diastolic area into 100. This gives the fractional area of shortening. Normally in term units, the value is around 35%. Uh, so uh, this can be an important marker uh, to assess the ventricular function, especially in cases of severe and critical pulmonary stenosis. Another important uh, 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 index that we can discuss is the myocardial performance index or day index for right ventricular function. In this, a uh, tissue Doppler uh, can be placed along the annulus of the uh, tricuspid valve, which can give a, 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 a graphical recording. Which, uh, so here, the intra uh, isovolumetric contraction and isovolumetric re uh, relaxation time is seen, and this is the ejection time. So this my performance, uh, this MPI or day index is calculated by IVCT plus IVRT divided by right ventricular ejection time. So IVCT plus IVRT divided by ejection time will be give you a myocardial performance index. And this can be used for the assessment of uh, uh, right ventricular function, just like left ventricular function. Another important thing, so once a fetal diagnosis is known or one is suspecting pulmonic stenosis, short axis view can give a very, large, uh, very important clue and uh, a direct evidence. So uh, as you see, this is a short axis view showing main pulmonary artery uh, and the uh, main pulmonary artery and the uh, pulmonary wall and the right and left pulmonary artery. Uh, and you can see the, uh, here uh, the valvular stenosis can be seen noted if there is a thickening of the wall or dome shaped configuration. Infundibular pulmonary stenosis and supravalvular pulmonary stenosis can also be noted. So this is an important view. The number of leaflets, dysplastic appearance, doming, and postnotic dilatation after the procedure, uh, and even after the procedure, the configuration can be seen. So this is very, very important while dealing with the case of critical pulmonic stenosis. Another important marker uh, is the uh, but easy marker that one can use is the right atrial pressure, indirect evidence to the IVC collapsibility index. So a uh, subcostal view can be taken. Uh, the probe can be placed in a sagittal uh, uh, placement along, uh, in the subcostal area, which can, as you can see here, which can show sure. the IVC opening into the right uh, uh, right, uh, right atrium, and uh, the collapsibility index can be calculated by measuring the uh, uh, distance in the inspiration, collapsing, and the inspiration uh, minus expiration divided by. Uh, collapse in the uh, inspiration. Uh, another important th thing that is important as far as this case is concerned is the shunting. So shunting across PDA. So uh, in this particular case, the decision was taken because uh, one of the finding that we had noted is the uh, presence of bidirectional shunting. So initially there was a left to right shunt followed by a uh, change in the uh, flow that the by right to left and uh, that is the bidirectional shunt was noted. So as you can see in the uh, short axis view, a Doppler is placed along the ductus and it can so show the uh, bidirectional shunting uh, uh, here. Systolic and diastolic and uh, waves can be seen and a bidirectional shunt that can be noted in this case. So this is an important factor that has to be seen while assessing a case of critical pulmonic stenosis. Another few factors is uh, one progressive RA dilatation, which can be noted on the four chamber view. Abnormal TV flow inflow velocity also can suggest diastolic right ventricular dysfunction. So coming to the treatment, so as we discussed, uh, very important uh, in any case of uh, duct dependent lesion is to 
uh, secure the uh, airway, breathing circulation has to be taken care of, uh, need for inotropes, uh, appropriate respiratory support is of paramount importance, monitoring the saturations, sugars, uh, providing uh, uh, adequate nutrition with IV fluids and uh, parental nutrition or uh, orographic feeds is very important uh, in these cases. Again, inotropic support and prostaglandin infusion is the main uh, one of the important factor which is uh, important while dealing with the cases of CCH. So as far as the uh, timing of intervention in pulmonic stenosis is concerned, so there are some emergency indications, emergency indications where intervention has to be done. So severe, any severe pulmonic stenosis with duct dependence, one has to go. So any pulmonary pressure more than 60, pulmonary pressure gradient more than 60 mm of Hg with the duct dependency, uh, it is important to intervene, which can be life-saving. Right ventricular dysfunction, uh, which can be picked up with echocardiography and other clinical signs, uh, regardless of the word. So whenever a right ventricular dysfunction is noted, one has to intervene on an urgent basis. Uh, elective intervention with the balloon pulmonary vol volvoplasty or balloon pulmonary volvotomy can be done with indications like any valvular PS having high pulmonary pressure gradient, whether it's symptomatic or asymptomatic, uh, it ha intervention has to be done. Any degree of pulmonic stenosis with even uh, mild hypoxia, uh, with even if the right ventricular function is normal, uh, even but if hypoxia is uh, noted in cases with any degree of PES, it becomes an uh, indication to intervene in these cases. Valvular PS uh, uh, due, or due to dysplastic wall, as noted in uh, syndromic variety, is also with uh, along with the other criteria like. Uh, ventricular dysfunction and increased pulmonary pressure gradient. So any syndromic variety with dysplastic wall is an also an uh, indication to intervene. So the time of, type of intervention is uh, balloon dilatation is preferred in the valvular PS as we have discussed with the balloon catheter uh, placement and uh, dilatation of the wall. So balloon dilatation is important. Surgical intervention, volvotomy, which is not so in neonates preferred procedure would be balloon dilatation than a surgical uh, intervention. Uh, uh, so it's, uh, certain indications are subvalvular or supravalvular PS. Uh, Noonan syndrome, especially with dysplastic wall is an indication or a failed balloon dilatation, one has to go with volvotomy. In conditions like in a bare focal pulmonic stenosis or peripheral pulmonic stenosis noted, balloon, surgical or both can be required in those cases. So talking about balloon pulmonary volvoplasty, the transcatheter balloon volvoplasty is the procedure of choice in units. Uh, the axis commonly used is femoral axis. Other axis can be transhepatic or transjugular. The catheter is advanced into the distal pulmonary branch to enable a wire to be advanced to serve as a rail for the balloon. Uh, low pressure balloon is selected with balloon size determined by the wall annulus diameter. So this is very important uh, uh, factor that one has to uh, note the wall annulus diameter and based on that the balloon size has to be uh, considered. This procedure is associated with good amount of success and repeat procedure is less uh, is uh, requirement for a repeat procedure is less than five percent. Uh, propanolol is used to reduce hyperdynamic infant dependent post procedure. So uh, this is also important uh, drug that can be used post procedure, especially when the infant dependent infant dependent is hyperdynamic. So complications while intervening in these cases with BPV are perforation of the right uh, outflow tract, perforation of the right uh, the right uh, outflow tract. Uh, pericardial effusion, massive per, uh, per pericardial or minimal per pericardial effusion, baby can go into cardiopulmonary arrest. Mortality rate is around 3%. 15% uh, of the babies can require re-intervention, especially dysplastic variety or, the inf or uh, neonates with infant dipolar stenosis. Hello. I would like to ask Dr. Kavya to add some points uh, over this. Dr. Vikrant, one thing, uh, pulmonary stenosis, indication for intervention, the thing is, it is the PFO which is shunting bidirectional and not the PDA. It's always the PFO shunt that we look at. That is one of the indications to intervene in a neonatal PS. Because the RV end diastolic pressures go up, there'll be TR, the PFO will shunt right to left or bidirectional. So we need to intervene if we see any PFO bidirectional shunt. It's not the PDA. Hello? Yeah, ma'am. You, can you hear me? Yeah, ma'am. Yeah, that is one thing I wanted to tell you throughout the uh, presentation, Dr. Vikram. Otherwise, nice presentation. Thank you. 
So any questions from the audience? Uh, inotrope of choice if these babies goes into shock? Generally, we don't prefer giving inotropes unless there is RV dysfunction. If there is RV dysfunction, dobutamine is a preferred agent rather than any other uh, inotropes. Dobutamine is preferred in this situation. But as uh, Dr. Vikrant rightly pointed out, if any RV dysfunction is there, then we need to, that is called critical pulmonary stenosis. When we have severe gradient across the pulmonary valve, in the presence of right ventricular dysfunction and PFO going right to left shunt, that is when we call the situation as critical pulmon pulmonic stenosis. And that requires emergency balloon pulmonary valvuloplasty and inotropes and any other measures may not be very helpful unless we open the valve. Any other questions from the audience? Anybody wants to make a comment on any cyanotic CHD, if you have doubts or anything like that, when to intervene, when to start prostaglandin, when can you start a prostaglandin infusion even without an echocardiographic evidence, you can please go ahead. Generally, cyanotic congenital heart disease or asynotic congenital heart disease, which are duct dependent. If you have cyanotic CHD, which is clinically you suspect duct dependent cyanotic CHD, you can always start off with prostaglandin without an evidence of any echocardiographic uh, diagnosis. The only condition which can be a little tricky is the obstructed TAPVC. If it is of the intracardiac variety of TAPVC, you can still start off with prostaglandin infusion because it can relax the ductus venosus and improve the symptoms. But any other kind of obstructed TAPVC starting uh, prostaglandin can be a little dangerous. So it's always better to have an echo diagnosis, but if it's not there, please go ahead and start it. And coming to duct dependent systemic circulation, this is little difficult to uh, pick up clinically you almost they present like other kinds of sepsis shock so any uh, systemic perfusion which is duct dependent like interrupted aortic arch hypoplastic left heart syndrome prostaglandin may be the decision may be delayed unless an echo is available because of the presentation like other neonatal common problems like uh, most often sepsis so i would say in that situation if you still have a high index of suspicion of congenital heart disease you can always start prostaglandin if there is improvement in perfusion with prostaglandin infusion it almost proves your diagnosis so you can go ahead and start prostaglandin there's no need to wait for an echo diagnosis to start prostaglandin at any point of time Any other questions anybody would like to ask? Um, any other echocardiographic finding that is not being discussed? And this is uh, the thing is, echocardiographically, I would say you have pretty much covered everything, Dr. Vikran. Mainly, the thing is the measuring the gradient across the pulmonary valve. Sometimes when uh, we say initially the gradients were only 40, 42, the reason being there is a PDA which is still open. So the pulmonary artery pressures have not completely come down. Since the PDA is open, the pulmonary artery pressures are little on the highest side. So whatever gradients we measure across the duct may not be very accurate in the first 24 to 48 hours of life. That's the reason the low gradients were picked up on day one of 
like so once we the tr jet gradient what we keep checking is a very important thing once the tr jet gradient of 83 says that the right ventricle is definitely suprasystemic if the systemic pressure in this baby is around 50 60 then definitely 83 is the right ventricular pressure which means there is suprasystemic right ventricular pressure so that becomes an indication for echo that's why looking at the morphology of the pulmonic valve gradient across the pulmonic valve shunting across the ast or the pfo and the trj gradient and again the morphology of the interventricular septum but most often by the time we see the interventricular septum either flattening or bowing into lv it is pretty late and uh, we often see in that situation right ventricular dysfunction so it's better we keep other parameters rather than only relying on the bowing of the ivs tap c and all these things are not very reliable in newborns honestly and it's quite difficult and cumbersome to measure all these at a bedside neonatal echo so i wouldn't put too much emphasis on tap c or tay index and all this it's more of the other echocardiographic parameters which are important in this situation and rv func fractional uh, area of shortening of rv is really difficult to measure if you have tried so uh, profiling the entire rv and measuring all these areas and volumes are really cumbersome and not in an nicu setup morphologically ma'am uh, what can we uh, we look at this factor but uh, sorry i didn't get you morphology of the valve in pulmonic stenosis generally pulmonic valve is a tricuspid pulmonic valve so if we look at we, if you look at the pulmonary valve on short axis view if you have a bicuspid valve or a unicuspid valve then more likely that this is valve is either going to get stenosed over time unlike aortic valve where almost 1 to 2% of general population can have a normal bicuspid aortic valve so the thing is along with assessing the leaflets number of leaflets in the pulmonary valve we look at whether it is thickened dooming and the annulus size if it is a hypoplastic annulus and very thick leaflets this is what we call dysplastic pulmonic valve and obvious uh, uh, and most often if there's a dysplastic pulmonary valve we don't have any main pulmonary artery dilatation so these valves may not yield much for balloon dilatation and most often they end up requiring surgical pulmonary valvotomy so assessing for the morphology of the pulmonary valve uh, helps in predicting the success of your ballooning if you have a thick leaflet valve good sized annulus with dilated main pulmonary artery more likely it's a normal thickened pulmonary valve so that the success of ballooning is much higher with those kind of valves rather than dysplastic pulmonary valve and infant villa pulmonic stenosis and supravalvular pulmonic stenosis there is no role of ballooning so we never use balloon dilatation for these conditions it's always surgical intervention and we often so don't see these as isolated problems we it's often associated with other congenital heart diseases so valvar ps or valvular ps is the only thing which can be an isolated problem other than not infundibular and supravalvular ps post dilatation ma'am how, how does it make like the annulus size increases and how does the valvular configuration change post dilatation no annulus size remains the same it is the commissure which are split when we do a ballooning so the valve once it is opened we try and stop the prostaglandin again see if there is severe right ventricular hypertrophy the rv is very thick non compliant then i prefer continuing prostaglandin for few more days till the rv hypertrophy comes down and the compliance improves this has happened previously recently i think maybe 6 months back a newborn almost a 40 day baby we did a balloon uh, pulmonary valvuloplasty severe right ventricular hypertrophy and the rv just refused to pump forward there was no anti grade flow from rv into pa though the valve was opened with a balloon so we continued with prostaglandin infusion for almost 2 weeks post dilatation so gradually the rv compliance improves and saturations remained at 80 it was at 40 and it came to 80 after balloon dilatation then gradually now the sats are around 95 child was dependent on oxygen for almost 3 months post procedure only then we could stop uh, oxygen so if pulmonary stenosis is left for longer time definitely there will be severe right ventricular hypertrophy and non compliant rv which may require long term prostaglandin even after you open the valve maybe for a couple of days or weeks also only when the rvh comes down rv compliance improves then we see that the things are better and rv is able to pump forward into the pulmonary circulation so that's the importance of doing balloon pulmonary valvuloplasty early on 
mean, propranolol, how, can, how long do we like? Uh, propranolol, uh, generally, if you have untreated severe or critical pulmonary stenosis for long time, propranolol may be required for at least three to six months depending on the degree of infundibular hypertrophy. But you have intervened early in uh, the phase of the illness, probably maybe a few days, I would say, because the infundibular hypertrophy is there and sometimes that goes into spasm, we do continue with propranolol immediately after procedure for probably, uh, I would say, a week or two weeks. Then we can safely stop propranolol. Another question, ma'am. Single yeah. ventricular physiology, does it need PG? Again, single ventricle physiology, Dr. Namita, okay. Single ventricle physiology depends on what kind of uh, single ventricle we are dealing with, Dr. Namita. If you have a reduced pulmonary blood flow situation, for example, you have uh, tricuspid atresia with pulmonary atresia or severe pulmonary stenosis, where again, the pulmonary circulation is uh, duct dependent, then definitely you need to start prostaglandin. But tricuspid atresia or any kind of single ventricle physiology has increased pulmonary blood flow. You should not start prostaglandin. In that situation, they need something called a pulmonary artery band around three to four weeks of age. And most often it has to be done earlier rather than later, the pulmonary artery band. So only situation where PGE1 is required in single ventricle is when there is decreased pulmonary blood flow situation, pulmonary stenosis or atresia kind of situation. Uh, cyanotic spells in neonates, almost the management is on the same lines. Only thing in neonates, if they go into spell, it's really difficult to manage them unless you are in a cardiac surgical center. I would say the management aspects of cyanotic spell in neonates is almost the same like we manage the other babies. Most important, hydration. As we always keep saying and discussing in newborns, it's the airway, breathing, circulation, and along with I would, that, I would say hydration. And rest all things, soda bicarbonate, uh, beta blockers, everything remains the same. No much change in management of uh, cyanotic spells. Uh, regarding this Volvo Tommy, uh, hmm. how does, how does, how can we can comment on the Volvo Tommy? Sorry, I didn't get you. Balloon pulmonary Volvo Tommy, it's a yeah. intervention if you're considering in a critical PS1. How does, uh, like, is it visible and uh, uh, better in units and uh, how, how would we go ahead? See, balloon pulmonary valvuloplasty in neonates has its own challenges. As uh, we all know, any newborn intervention carries a lot of risk. Most important, better to do it in a controlled environment and always intubate the child. Many centers don't uh, intubate newborns before procedures, but almost all the guidelines say that any neonatal procedure, especially cardiac, children, babies have to be intubated because you have control over airway and uh, breathing. So the chances of problems are much less if the child is on uh, ventilator support, one thing. Second thing, in a severe pulmonary stenosis, it's always wise to keep the duct open because when you're trying to pass across the pulmonary valve, again, as I told you, because of hypertrophy, right ventricular infundibulum can completely shut off, close. Sometimes we have seen this, it, it goes into just spasm. So practically the child doesn't have any pulmonary blood flow in those situations. So child can crash acutely on cat table. That's why I always prefer keeping the PDA open for that safety margin. And also when we cross across the pulmonary valve with a wire, the PDA gives us a good anchor. We can pass from the pulmonary valve, pulmonary artery through the duct and park our balloon support wires in the descending aorta. That gives a great margin of safety and support. So always keep the duct open till you're doing balloon pulmonary value plus in a newborn and never exceed the valve annulus size. The balloon diameter should not exceed more than 140% of the annulus. For example, in the baby, which was explained, it was 6.4 millimeter, sorry, 5.4. And we used a six size balloon. Six is the diameter of the balloon and two centimeters is the length of the balloon. We don't use very long balloons in babies also because we can end up dilating the right ventricle outflow tract or the pulmonary, main pulmonary artery. So ideal size of balloon, either for balloon aortic or pul uh, pulmonary valvuloplasty is always two centimeter in a newborn, which is a shorter balloon. If we use three centimeter on aortic side, we'll end up damaging the mitral apparatus. If we use it in the right side, we end up damaging the right ventricle outflow tract. 
So always use a balloon on aortic side. The balloon size should be only 80 to 80 percent to 100 percent of the valve size. Suppose if I have a 6 mm aortic annulus, the balloon should not exceed 5, 5.5. So that is the dictum on aortic side. And on right side, 120 to 140. Make sure you don't cause pulmonary regurg in a baby with critical PS. Because of severe right ventricle hypertrophy, any amount of PR may not be tolerated and child can go into acute right heart failure. So even if you under dilate, it's okay. If the pressure is dropped by 50%, at least that is a successful balloon valvuloplasty. It can be redilated at any time safely. So it's always important to keep that safety thing in mind whenever newborn interventions are being done. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, okay. I'm sorry. Basically, the mother needs to. Mother needs to. See, that is something uh, which is uh, kind of uh, timely work that somebody has to do. Anybody else wants to ask any questions? Maybe. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Big Ben. Yeah, ma'am. Thank you so much.